this is Monday, December 5th. This is uh, <clears throat> yet another installment of the Timex Sinclair online user group. Uh, folks have been super, super busy the past, this past uh, couple of weeks, and Adam's made some breakthroughs in digital archaeology, I think. Oh, with, I don't know about some, that, but with some help from a few others. <laughs> Um, I got some more files for you, Adam, in case you want to try to recover them. <laughs> um, but I figure uh, let's 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 start with you, Adam. Let's tell us tell us your your tale of of woe and then success. Uh, well, uh, let's see. Last time I think I already talked about recording the uh, TS twenty six D eight library tape uh, from that I borrowed from Ryan. So I don't think I need to go over that again. But um, in the last couple of days, I've been messing around with some of those disk images that uh, David and his crew got together and archived up on archive.org. And um, the reason I started doing that was it's been on a, like the back burner in my mind. And I don't know if I ever would have gotten to it, but since we have these meetings, I wanted to have something to talk about, you know? So um, I decided uh, Saturday, I would work on it Saturday, but I didn't really have time. So I worked on it yesterday. And I basically, I took um, the, I think we've talked about it before because we talked about it here and also on the um, discussion forum on groups that I owe that uh, there's a utility called uh, tomato, which stands for something, but I don't remember what. And uh, it allows you to uh, work with the disk images uh, that uh, were archived recently and uh, from command line. And I guess there's a front end for it too that will work with Windows, but all the links I could find to it were dead, so I, I, I couldn't use it. So, I mean, it's not like I can't use a command line, so I did that. And uh, I was able to like the dump a listing. I only worked on one disk and I had a, maybe a couple disks, but one that I talked about. And um, it had a game on there called uh, Qbert. And I dumped the entire floppy disk, uh, well, the image of the floppy disk that was already available to a tape, which is just a one command basically that you can use from Tomato. And uh, so basically you get a tape that I think in the end with all the programs on it, it was about 13 or 15 minutes, something like that. And um, the, the tomato utility has a lot of stuff it can do, but I didn't really do much of that. I just was trying to get the basics down and see if I could load off the, um, the tape, which is just a, let's see, did it make a wait? No, it made a TZX, I think. David, is that right? Does it make a TZX? I think it does. Yeah, it makes it. I'm, I'm just looking. I'm just looking now. Now, uh, does it make a TZX or does it make a tap file? Oh, I think it makes a tap file. Tap file. Right. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you. So it made a tap file, and then I used uh, a utility um, for Windows that uh, converted that to a WAV file, and I tried loading it on my 2068, which was successful to a point. But the uh, program which I was trying to use, which was a a basic rendition of Qbert, um, wasn't working properly. And I thought maybe there was an error um, from the disk, but no, David pointed out and some other people did, Ryan, I think too, that um, try looking at the code that it's spitting up on, which I did. <laughs> and I think I think I memorized it because I saw the error so many times. I think it was uh, line 9940. <laughs> I think I'm echoing too. Am I echoing now too? I can hear myself echoing. You're good for me. Okay. Well, uh, so I, I looked at that line and it was trying to load a section of code from floppy. And so... I changed that to load, or I thought I changed that to load from tape. And I kind of got some squirrely results and some other people made some suggestions. And then today, Johnny Red um, took that, uh, those two files, the basic file and the code and uh, made a separate uh, tap image or TZX image, one or the other. Mm -hmm. And I converted that to a WAV file um, and loaded it onto my real 2068 today and didn't have time to actually Play it well, like one time just to try it, and it worked successfully. So um, that's one program that actually works off there. I'm sure they all can be made to work, but I didn't realize that they'd be modified to work from a floppy disk system. Although that makes perfect sense now, but didn't at the time. So so let me when you loaded the the Q Qbert program, uh, did uh, did it really and start trying to load load the the code file, or did you have to you know? You just well, type in run you mean get it, get it the original um, file from that I transferred over from the disk? Yeah, yeah, or the one that the Donnie Red made for you. Well, Johnny Red changed the program uh, to work properly because what happens is it automatically executes line uh, nine nine forty, which loads the next section of code. Yeah, from 
floppy, which is not there, obviously. And it's it's um, using what is it load asterisk, and that's not part of Sinclair Basic, so it it's yeah. it's not happy with that, and it dies. So I changed it so it would load um, the next section of code, but apparently it's case sensitive, which I don't think I knew that. Oh. Mm -hmm. and, I'd forgotten um, that that it was case sensitive. I looked it up, and I thought, oh yeah, that's why you saw what you saw. It kept trying to load right. all of them. It doesn't right. load them. It just goes through them all and says none of these are what you wanted. Right, yeah. that's what it was doing. But so uh, I guess Johnny Red uh, took the program today, and um, or last night or tomorrow, whatever, wherever he lives. <laughs> I think he lives in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he made it so it would load properly from tape and tried it in the Fuse emulator, and it worked perfectly the very first time on my real hardware. That's awesome. And I was able to play the game. Um, and it's um, plays with key, from the keyboard, but it works pretty well. And um, you know, it's basic. And um, some people aren't into using basic games at all, but I, I have a fascination with them because they were um, usually programmed by amateurs like me who could um, uh, get something on the screen, and they were you know maybe worked on it uh, part time and as a hobby, which is what I'm also doing. And so they weren't trying to make money off of it. Although, what do I know? Maybe this was released on tape and sold for twenty bucks. I don't know where well, its origin. I would argue honestly. that I would argue that the, you know, programming in basic on these machines was kind of the point. Yes, um, I agree. But what what it became, of course, was just hey, here's a here's a games machine. I have a plausible excuse to buy, and so people didn't really, you know, once you could get the games. A lot of people then didn't program. Exactly. But the whole yeah. point was the original point of them was was like, hey, you know, we can program on these things. And then the games kind of came of like, I, the sense I got was a lot of the games were, you know, maybe surprises to the the creators in in terms of how how good they some of them actually were. So from the creators or from people who are using their programs? What do you mean? Of the machines. Oh, oh yeah uh -huh. yeah uh -huh. yeah i have a a tale of i wouldn't say a tale of woe exactly but i used to um type in the basic programs when i was in junior high school when i was in like sixth seventh and eighth grade and then when i was in seventh grade um someone introduced me to a floppy disk for my commodore 64 that came with all these atari soft titles and after that i never typed in a basic program again for quite some time <laughs> i just got floppies from people and i was like who needs basic after all but uh over the years, I've learned to appreciate it, mostly because of the Astrocade and how that was really the only option. And um, it built up a little community writing programs, kind of like the Timex uh, 1000, because it only had about one or 2K of RAM. Yeah. Of wow. Yeah. Well, that's really able to get that to, to, to finally. I wonder what that code bit is. Does it use does it use um, user-defined graphics? The, the, it seems the to, yeah. OK, yeah. then that might, be, that might be what it is. What it is. The fix might be in the code file. Code file. OK. Yeah. Cool. Very good. Did cool. you have any other questions about uh, that? No, I, no. I just wanted you to tell the story. So it was so funny. It was so funny how you know we went. You know, you you announced that you got that you got into a certain point. You know, everybody sort of jumped. sort of jumped in, and all of a sudden it was solved. <laughs> yeah, I was glad to see that, and I was also hoping that like because uh, this group seems uh, really friendly. So, or it is really friendly, especially me. I'm really friendly. So. Uh... <laughs> I was hoping people would help me out, and people did. So, and yeah, from, yeah, oh, and that's that about awesome. it on that subject, I guess. But the load asterisk actually sounds like it was trying to load from a streamy floppy. Well, so that, that asterisk um, is, is is it's a there's a little bit of code in the in the expansion ROM that looks for that, and and that's the hook also for. The interface one on the spectrum. So when you plug an interface one into your spectrum, your spectrum, it has a ROM in it, and uh, it it sort of inter it sort of intercepts the original spectral spectrum on reset resets eight maybe thirty eight or something like that. So basically, what happens? Basically, what happens when you know go to load a program program from a string floppy or from the from the time uh disk drive, disk drive system it you know you type in load in load and the and the quotes and the file name and whatever right and that uh, uh that causes an error uh, to happen and, and 
it jumps to the jumps to this special piece of code, handles the error, and and processes it, processes it, processes it as if it were if it were uh, normal. Um, now, is that part of the uh, 2068's ROM? It allows that to happen, or are they taking advantage of it somehow? To so, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's the piece of code anticipating that the disk the disk drives come along that that have that will interpret for the aster the asterisk and of course it won't work you know you know on a machine have a disk drive system it'll it'll give you a some of an error but you know by the same token you can you can enter a valid version of any of the the uh disk disk command you know they're on they're on the keyboard keyboard and and almost all of them all of them will validate the do anything uh, so yeah that that's not you know the no, the, the asterisk isn't an error or error or, it's just this uh it's it's uh it's like an interrupt int into the very processing if you don't mind the, my jumping in david yeah 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 um looking at the rom what happens is that um when the when you have an interface one or several of the other interfaces plugged in it monitors the call to the error routine at restart eight, and it switches in the ROM from the interface or the expansion module where the, the lower 8K of the basic ROM resides, and then it picks up um, processing from there. What, Jeff? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, Ado, you're back. Yes. <laughs> Good to see you. See you. <laughs> I I uh, didn't fit in Turkey. <laughs> I think I see a new a new name, Paulson. Are you there? Hi hey there. What's going on? Hey Paul. Paul. Oh, oh, I recognize your back your background. <laughs> That is, I reckon, that is, I recognize. <laughs> Go ahead, Jack, too. <laughs> hey, I do have a question for everyone, because <clears throat> I'm not sure if this is open forum or we have a special guest or whatever. No, 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 open. Go ahead. Um, okay, love all the emails. A lot of it's, it's over my head, uh, but I just love the Timex, okay, the Timex Sinclair. Are you guys playing on the Timex machine or are you doing emulators? Like I'm asking it, everyone. It's a mixture of both, I think, for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I personally prefer to use the real hardware just because I like a crappy looking screen. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I also use Fuse uh, uh, sometimes too. Just uh, it's, it's, it's faster, but um, right. it's... Because a long work. time, a long time ago, I did the we're we're a haven we're, a we're um, the emulator, and it really didn't either. I didn't take the time or whatever, and it kind of worked, kind of not, and you know, really had a huge break in time from anything Timex. Um, but um, now that I'm back on li looking at all these emails that you guys send back and forth, I'm like, oh, geez, wow, okay. Um, so it's like, does anyone use their machines anymore? Or is it yeah. just an emulator? I use mine to run the stuff, all the coding I do on the emulator. It's much easier to type. And, yeah, okay, and fair you, enough. And you can import stuff from a text editor. So. so. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, and and actually actually Tim, um, Tim might, might want to talk, talk about this. There's a, a, a you can you know type in in programs uh, in any kind of, kind of text edit editor, and then there's a program that you can run, run and that will into a tap file that you file that you can load to, you know an emulator or, or the real thing, and it's so much faster. Tim, okay. yeah, you, you want to you want to <laughs> you want to expand on on that a little bit? <laughs> Just like you said, yeah. In fact, someone con someone raised an issue. It said make pass as a I've done a fork that um, does the um, 2068 keywords. Um, and uh, um, someone sent me a link to hundreds of lines of code he's written in 
because like uh, Zed Makepass lets you write the code without line numbers. You can just put labels and just write it freeform. And um, and he's he's got a whole repo with new games and various bits he's built. And he was asking for a few features and um, some enhancements. Yeah. Was this for was this for the the for the or for the twenty twenty sixty eight he's writing? And, um, I I didn't look what he was targeting, but yeah, quite a lot of yeah. It might just be Spectrum. Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't, okay. I didn't think that's crazy cool mm. that's very cool hey, Tim, the um on on <clears throat> you know the convention that that's used there for escaping the graphics characters and such mm -hmm. um is that that appears of course to be used by uh list basic from the fuse utilities who, who's who created that standard the, the, as far as I can tell, the original maker who's writer of Zed Makepass kicked all that off. And there's a variety of other tools that had been sort of based on his code. But I, I'm not entirely certain. That's that the dot colon sort of format for the yes. box, box and things. Yeah, no, I'm not sure the originator. The earliest trace I can find of it is the Zed Makepass. But there's, there's probably some, you know, more origin story than that. Yeah, Ryan, you use uh, ZMake Basic uh, or ZMake Base or however you say it, right? Yeah, I, I use Tim's fork of that. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, that's what I call my programs when I'm typing in from, from magazines. The, the uh, only... Um, oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, go ahead, Ryan. No, I was just, I was just curious because one of the things I, I noticed um, was the when there's a token that's in a string or a rem statement for example that gets converted to text instead of a token code well because there's no token code to convert to so it's in other words it's it doesn't get escaped there was never an escape uh, convention for the tokens uh you know like mainly the keywords right so I guess they figured you wouldn't use that, but what happened was, is I had programs where I had like, I'm looking for you pressing that key, which might be like symbol shift A, I think stop. So I just had the stop keyword in quotes, but then list basic converted that to STOP <laughs> and then it wouldn't, going back, it wouldn't work anymore. So I just converted those to character codes, but um, I didn't know like, who originated that and how you might be able to come around to extending it to include keywords in some fashion. Yeah, I mean, bang, bang, I'm the one of the, the issues the guy raised was that um, um, you couldn't put an at sign in a, in a um, because that's one of the little escape things in, the, uh, in a string. Um, and that seemed to be by design. Um, but I'm going to do a, a tweak to allow you to do that. Um, so uh, Ryan, just put an issue in. Let's, let's fix these things. Let's make this thing more useful. Yeah, I'll think about how it, we can think about how we might escape the keywords then. Okay. Very cool. So, Paul, does that answer your question? You know what, do you know about the various various emulators, players, Paul? Okay, I'm sorry, say again, please, David. Do you know about the various emulators? Which ones are available? Well, the only one that I, I mean, I did, go online and search for them and everything else. But I had the Warayevo. Does everyone, yeah. anyone remember that one? I don't know if it's still around. That's the only one I had and I, I have not loaded anything. Now, do I have to, what's the latest Windows version you can use? Oh, anything. Uh, uh, there's the, the two main ones that, that, I, that, that I fuse and CC Sorox. And I use I use those actually on on a Mac. A Mac just install Fuse on my little tiny box. Um, uh, Dave, not to interrupt here, but you seem to be having a lot of echo. At least I'm having I... a lot of echo, and it's an interfering with what you're saying, and it makes it very difficult for you uh, for us to understand. Yeah, I don't know if it's echo so much as it's uh, your. It's it's like you're jumping. Yeah, you're you're. It's like catching, catching or skipping little pieces of your audio. Your audio. 
And sometimes it'll repeat. Yeah, sometimes it'll repeat what you just said, but repeat. it's not necessarily an echo. It's uh, something yeah, going on with the audio capture there. It sounds like a delay loop. Okay. Glitch in the matrix. <laughs> Max headroom. <laughs> yeah, that's what Ryan was saying, yeah. I'm sure you'll you'll listen to it when you watch the replay. But <laughs> and I love it. Is is this any better? Uh, talk some more. We'll find so out. So far, okay. so good. So far, so good. All right. That's my microphone on the on the computer itself, which I have no clue where it is. <laughs> oh well, it's working really good. So okay, cool. All right, cool. Um, so Fuse the Sorox. There's one for the 81. It's just called 81. Um, that's really good. I just loaded that because I was um, I was trying a tape that I had uh, recorded with with um, Audacity. Uh, I was trying to use that. Um, I know there's others out there, but but you can use you know you can use any modern computer Linux. Disorx runs on Linux. Fuse is written for Unix machines. Okay. No, that sounds good. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Even even drummers can figure it out. <laughs> oh, Wait a minute. Don't, don't be putting me in that category. Uh, I'm not that good. Shots fired. <laughs> well, you know, it says the bass player. <laughs> You know, maybe David. Um, in the future, we can have a uh, someone who's really good at using these emulators can, which is not me, by the way. Can I give a presentation on them? Yeah, like that'd that? be cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that probably yeah, a bunch of people will probably find that helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that would be great. Okay, cool. Um, we'll yeah, do the reason. Oh, I'm sorry. The reason why I asked was um, I did very small amount of programming in Quick Basic. Yeah. And there was one that was 32 bits, and I had to find one that was a 64 bit. That's the reason why I'm asking. And so I didn't know if it mattered. Huh. Um, I don't think so. OK. I don't think so. I haven't, had, I haven't encountered any problems. Isn't Windows 64-bit now? Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, and, and I'm running, uh, I've run both um, Zuex or whatever that is and 81 on my 64-bit machine. It runs okay. just fine. Perfect. Okay. I appreciate the input, guys. But it doesn't run any faster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I'd like to suggest that uh, yeah we could maybe make a list of things like you know utilities and things that uh, that we all might use like co also cover the fuse utilities. Yeah. Um, probably even show how to use Audacity. That's can be a pretty common thing you would use. Mm. Um, stuff like that might be useful also. Uh, World, of Spectrum a list. Has a, World of Spectrum has a list of, of utilities, but uh, not too many of them are Windows. They're mostly DOS operated, but they work quite well under um, they work quite well under uh, DOS box. So, David, you mean literally that they're for DOS, like they're not command line? No, I mean literally they're for for DOS. Ah, I see. Wow. Well, there are a few that are com uh, command line, like there's a, I believe there's a tap to wave for a conversion uh, file that will, that's a command line. So you have to use like uh, um, um, tape to wave, the name of tap file, and then name of uh, a wave file that you wanted to convert it to. And mm -hmm. then you hit enter and it does its thing and you have your wave file, but uh, uh, those seem to be the few among the many, but uh, yeah, you'll find them. You'll find them all on the uh, ZX, uh, sorry, Sinclair World. Um, oh, Sinclair World ZX World, their, and their own yeah. section. Yeah, they're those. Those guys are very focused on the the eighty one slash one thousand, and have a smaller section for Spectrum stuff, but yeah. Yeah. But there is stuff there. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a good point. Okay. Cool. So Jeff, what have you been doing? 
Jeff Burrell. Oh, <laughs> I was wondering which Jeff. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Don't worry, Jeff. Jeff K is next. <laughs> um, I've uh, I've been working on porting over the video routines to the new FPGA board that um, that I uh, uh, built, and so I've been able to get that compiled for the new uh, uh, Affinity uh, FPGA. And as a matter of fact, just today um, I got the new boards for that. That's the board for plugging into the into the uh, 2068 where I'll okay. mount the FPGA. So that has the video, uh, some RAM and the buffers on here. And then a second daughter board that'll hold the uh, um, uh, Raspberry Pi Pico. I ordered some uh, uh, Raspberry Pi Pico W's that have an onboard Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope you all appreciate that. The cost went from $5 to $6. <laughs> Bill of materials cost is creeping up. So at any rate, uh, that would that would allow Wi-Fi serial access to a compact flash all in that one, one little part. So um, as soon as I get the video working and know I can get the FPGA uh, program, then I'll go ahead and move on to getting the, the uh, disc routines ported it over and and uh, try and get all that working. Wow. Jeff, wow. what do FPGA chips uh, cost? Like the one you would have to use in this product? I'm curious. I've no, I never, I never work with them. I don't know what they cost. Um, that this one is is not particularly cheap. It's like twelve dollars mm -hmm. uh, in in onesies at DigiKey, and you need a configuration ROM for that, and that's like a couple of dollars. Now, what you get in this FPGA is 20,000 gates, which frankly is enough to put an entire 2068 on that chip because it also has slightly less than 128K of RAM inside the chip. So you could, you could basically do a, a standard 2068 with you know, uh, VGA, ULA plus the whole smash on there. So... Which, by the way, do, um, does anyone know where I can pick up a couple of the of the keyboard um, um, ribbon cables for a twenty sixty eight? Yes. Oh, I'll send you okay. One yes. Because <laughs> I have a I have a, a dead um, or I have an empty twenty sixty eight case, and I'd like to put I'd like to put an, an a hardware emulated twenty sixty eight in there sometime. So don't, you know, don't think you have to send off those, those uh, ribbon cables too soon because oh. I have a few other things to do first. Do you, do you have the little connector too? Uh, that one I can, uh, 14, 10, I think I can get that from DigiKey. I, I might have one or two of those too. Yeah, okay. So Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And a Happy New Year. Absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, Jeff does ha is the only person with a tree in the background. So right, right. Yeah. Jeff's the only one in season. <laughs> and this one wishes you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Very nice. <laughs> so, David, you mm -hmm. you quite asked me about strengthening. Yeah. Strength uh, uh, let me let me try and explain. I, I was able to pick up this little device. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from, uh, whoops, I guess it might help if I had it right side up, uh, on Amazon, and it works well, but the signal that's coming out of the, uh, out of the uh, 2068 does not seem to be really that strong, and though, uh, uh, although I put the screen brightness up to max, uh, it's uh, still quite uh, dim, so I was wondering if there's something like an inline amplifier that could go between the uh, this adapter and the and the twenty sixty eight to boost the signal. Well, I'll tell you what you've gotten further along than I have. I have a similar thing, and I can't even get it to lock on the comp composite video signal. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but 
if you, I if have you, a, I have a similar issue too. Like I can, like, uh, I can get it. To, I have a couple of different devices to work with it. Uh, one of them works okay. One of them, um, when I use it, it doesn't lock properly and I just get a flickering screen and I see a picture and then it disappears and it's, and it's an upscaler. I also, um, have a frame meister, which should work with everything and it does. But then when I try to capture the video, um, it doesn't, it also, it, in fact, it crashed my video, uh, capture device, um, like the hardware of it, I had to like redo it. So, um, hmm. I, I don't mess around with, the uh, the output from there anymore. Now I just take pictures of the screen with a, my camera or take video of the screen because I, I cannot get it to work like I want it to. Well, yeah. I, I get a steady picture, but it's, uh, it's not the brightest. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if I was to use it for any, any length of time, I would be suffering from eye strain. Um, I was wondering too, uh, is it maybe that uh, the it is this device is being underpowered? Uh, well, what are you using to power it? I'm just using a standard uh, USB uh, to. Uh, well, okay, yeah. So does it does the? Uh, yeah, I can't quite read that. I'm wondering if it. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's gonna. It just on. uses probably a five volt. Like a yeah, USB, less than an amp, you think, Carl? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, that yeah. thing can't take more than an amp. Probably yeah. 500 milliamps. Yeah. But I think you know what you're saying is, you know, at the 2068, the composite signal can only be so high, right? Otherwise, you'd saturate the the input circuitry yep. for that thing. But you know, I know you can probably change some resistors on the on the you know the transistor drive circuitry i believe that's that's you know outputting the composite signal um mm -hmm. so you may be able to get more you know more gain out of it that way but i i don't have a schematic in front of me to, to look at but i'm sure there's something and i'm sure there are you know uh video boosters that you can plug in you know after the fact right like uh uh, something that you might find for a, a distribution system, right? That they need to run, you know, 20 TVs off of one signal and you're not going to do that by just <laughs> the one output, right? They've got a, hmm. um, they basically reamplify it or maybe even, a, like I said, one of those macro vision uh, strippers, you know, basically a time-based corrector, right? Which will regenerate the signal. And uh, I mean, those those aren't that expensive. I think some for some of the lower end ones, you know, forty, thirty, forty dollars. I think for those things. Yeah, and Jeff just shared a, a video distribution amplifier. I'd completely forgotten about these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you're yeah, you're putting it out to a bunch of TVs, it's got to boost the signal. Yeah. Yeah. I one of the that, I use that little adapter on the ZX eighty ones for the outputs from those little ginger electronic. Um, composite video adapters and I get a and they always work you know just plug it in and I could use um, an HDMI monitor for my ZX81 huh huh okay and, and the other stuff. the other thing yeah. oh go yeah. ahead Stuart no they're those things are really cheap like seven dollars six dollars <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah just go down to your uh, well, what you know, we don't really have them here. Video fries, channel? no more fries, right? Fries are gone, but uh, micro centers, eBay, eBay sell. So well, yeah, them. eBay sells them there too. I mean, but there's so many. Yeah, Amazon, you can get them, but there's so many different companies that sell. You know, I basically, I bet the guts are the same, but they brand them with their own thing. But uh, yeah, you know, the other thing to look at is if you're not too worried about the colors, right? If you don't need bright, is you know something similar to what David's already, you know basically taking the RGB off the back mm -hmm. and uh, that gives you a, a really, really, that way you just don't deal with the analog you know, signal at all, <laughs> but yeah. you do lose bright obviously, but uh, hopefully maybe, you know, soon I can get some time or David can get some time to see if we can actually tap into the YUV signals inside the, the 2068 and actually digitize that. And then we will, we will maintain the bright uh, unlike the Spectrum, or not the Spectrum, uh, the uh, TC2068s, right? And the TC2048s, those SCLDs actually have a bright pin that comes out. Yeah. yeah. And so we can actually, um, actually comes out to the back expansion bus, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. 
So those machines, you can probably do RGB with bright. Unfortunately, we can't do that with the 2068 unless we, yeah, I don't, I don't, there's no way to do it. It's all internal to the chip. So I don't think there's any way we could uh, like tap somewhere and, and pull that out. Just find the magic spot to drill a little tiny hole. Yeah. <laughs> what's, what size bit do you need for that, David? <laughs> oh, you know, I think it's the one that they use for for implanting wires in your head for, you know, <clears throat> experiments or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and, and don't breathe or hiccup because then now you've just killed a 2068 SCLD chip. So, and there aren't any yeah. more of those around. Yes, yes. <laughs> hey, Jeff K. Have you have you made progress in your adventures? Um, I haven't done too much. I'm still working on Wes. I don't know how you pronounce his last name. That Brzezowski. Brzezowski. Yes. Um, um, I'm still working on taking that 64 column um, machine code from what was it? Sync Times or whatever the magazine like is. Sync us. And yeah, and um. I had some typos in it. So, of course, you know, you call it and it would just freak out. And so I wrote a dot net program. So it would use text to speech and actually read the program back to me. Like when you're talking about taking a text editor, typing it in and putting it through ZMake base and stuff. I mean, um, base to tap. And so I found the typos, I think. But I need to, I guess, understand how to actually load the tap into the emulator because it loads the machine code does a save code and like saves a block starting at 60,000 decimal but then if I try to read it back in it's like it's not reading the machine code in so I don't know if I when I photocopied the article from the archive.org if I chopped off some of the lines or something I'm gonna have to look um, so my adventure has just kind of been like real slow the last couple of weeks. Well, all you gotta do is ask on the list, you know, like Adam, and then boom, bing, bing, boom, it'll all get solved. As I said today, like, I'm sure people just help me out to shut me up because I'll just keep asking over and over, you know, <laughs> like a broken record. And everyone here remembers what records are. So no, and I do, I, yeah. <laughs> Very funny. All right. Well, you know, you know. David, I, I wanted to, uh, since Jeff was just talking about 64 column mode, uh, one of the programs that was on that floppy disk that I experimented with uh, was called 64 column or 64 call. And I thought it was going to put the 2068 into 64 column mode, which it, I guess it sort of does. But rather than doing that, it's like it's drawing the letters super, super slowly in like yeah. high res mode or something. It's really strange it's not like um when you're using the what is it, is it password what is the word processor that uses 64 columns uh, both uh both m script and password can do it okay it's yeah columns. like that's fast it's like as if you're typing on a regular screen but using this little basic programmer i don't even know what it was i loaded it up and it was like so slow on real hardware it was just like drawing the letters but it, it's 64 column like they were tiny yeah. but um yeah it was weird yeah, if it's a big if it's basic, I can understand why it would be very slow. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, the Tazword uh, people put out a utility called Tazwide. And I think it basically used their font technology. And I guess you, I don't remember it. I know I've got a, I might could recover it on tape somewhere, but um, basically there were some, you could call in the utilities to, use their tiny fonts for a, a 64 column mode for your program. And I think I'm trying to remember uh, something just kind of comes back to me from the time frame of, you know, when that 2068 came out, people were experimenting, right, with using those higher res column modes. Not everybody totally understood how to do it, right? So that's, you know, obviously Taz word, they, you know, they pretty much got it down, but these other experimentations from, I think, other individuals or people that were trying to do that kind of thing maybe ended up with what, you know, you're talking about there, Adam, with their their attempt to do something high res like that, and they weren't really doing it the right way, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. I, I agree. Yeah, I think, uh, Stuart, you used to sell OS 64, right? The basic that used high res mode? Um, well, 
these or sold cartridge, yeah, 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 as a ROM cartridge. Right. Yeah, I've used it, and it's uh, you know, it works like I would expect it to fast, not like. Yeah, I'm getting off the subject here, but yeah, it's it was just interesting that Jeff brought up 64 column mode and screwing around with that disc. You never know what's going to be on those things, even when you know what they're called. I thought it was going to be like something real, not just like some faking it to 64 column mode, since the system does have it built in, you know? Well, think yeah. of it this way, Adam. It'd be great for a word processing program. You could process one word. You're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in time by your for your next birthday. <laughs> uh, I believe that Larry Kenny on his last um, uh, version of LK DOS <clears throat> had a, uh, had a routine in there that would also display in sixty four column mode. Uh, now I don't know how to access it. It's probably described in his manual, which is available. I believe I gave David a. Uh, Mm -hmm. a copy of his manual so i believe in there there's an explanation on how to access that but it does uh, uh access um well a 64 color mode and the demo that larry gave me did work quite quickly in fact it was like uh, boom yeah like anything out of out of machine code Adam, I suspect it is what you are saying, that it is literally drawing the characters, like Logo would draw stuff. Oh, goodness. Yeah, that probably is what it's... Yeah, if, God. If comparing it to Logo is a really good example. Yeah. If that's what it looks like, then that's probably what it's doing. And that would be slower than death. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's almost worth uh, loading it up just to see it, but really it's not. Just trust me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Adam, we do have about an hour and 15 minutes in case you want to... Uh... <laughs> draw one word? <laughs> you might be able to you know pull your z80 out of your uh 2068 and put like a 8 megahertz version in there or a 12 <laughs> megahertz version <laughs> i don't know how everything else would work but uh at least the processor would be faster Very cool I, uh, you know uh, carl i know you're making a joke there but is anyone here who has any um experience with the what was it the z8000 the 16-bit version of the z80 only Somebody? having read a little bit about it, but yeah, you know, same yeah. here. So yeah, I don't know if any but anything really used that because um, that was towards the end of Zilog's, um, you know, Z80 phase, right? That was their their bread and butter, and I know they were thinking of coming up with the next iteration of the Z80 in a 16-bit format, but I just don't think really anybody used it too much. I see. I remember. I seem to remember it was used in a couple of military systems, but uh, it it died pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Zilog kind of died there, and and um, yeah, so I don't, yeah, I don't think there's that many systems that really took advantage of that. There was, I believe, there was at least one Unix system that, but you know, not a great quantity of them, but. Somebody did build some kind of Unix system with the uh, 8,000. <clears throat> and then there was the supposed to be the 80,000. I don't know if you guys recall that, Ugh. which got announced, but I don't think it got past being announced. <laughs> <laughs> well, the EZ80 was a pretty popular processor. I think it still is for, yeah, it for, is. for, for IO stuff. Yeah, it's nice. Those little EZ80 boards are fantastic. <clears throat> so, Stuart, how are you doing? What have you been up to? Um, well, um, a number of things. Um, my little project <clears throat> to um, use the tactile feel um, Ginger Electronic ZX81 keyboards as, uh, you know, make I have a USB adapter for it. <laughs> um, I had some problems because um, my collection of I, I did, first I used the Leonardo, and then when I designed the circuit board, I used um, I designed it for a um, a Pro Micro, which has you know the same chip in it, so it can um, act like a mouse or a USB keyboard. Um, but my collection of clones was like five years old or so, and I had issues with the 
with uh, those micros. So <laughs> I finally got another batch from China <laughs> and, um, and all those problems went away. So the hardware works well, but there's, so I'm currently in the mode of better understand, I'm rewriting the software because I have a couple of problems. Um, I don't fully understand um, what keys the emulators are all receiving and happy with um, actual signals. And um, my little um, board puts out um, keys into my PC that many applications are happy with, you know, uh, it'll, it, it can go into Notepad, it can go into Word, it can go into the title bar on the browser. But if I pull up 81, the emulator, it, it does not take the keystrokes from my little oh, weird. Uh, my, uh, micro, um, pro micro. So I have not I'm just thinking today different ways to pursue it. One thing I haven't done is I haven't gone back to the Leonardo and tried it on the 80, see if it's something about the signature of, um, I don't know what signatures the different processors within Windows would expect, why it won't go to um, 81. I haven't pulled out, tomorrow I'll pull out a Raspberry Pi with it, that emulator on it and see if the Raspberry Pi is happy with it. Mm. The, and I haven't, um, I have, I don't have all the keys mapped. In other words, I have all the keys working, but um, I haven't uh, written the software to accommodate uh, the combinations like with the shift. This is different people are handling this, this different way. I've seen um, a couple of different things. Um, so I just basically have to work on the software, make sure, uh, um, I don't know, I've been, it, it's been taking me onto different paths, like understanding the USB interface better, which yeah. is quite complicated. Wow. Um, you know, and what those signals are between the computer and depending on which mode of negotiates, which speed it is. And it's, and the computer asks for keyboard information every 16 milliseconds and all this kind of stuff. So <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I, uh, I'm i sure I'll get to the root of this by some combination. Well, either finding a person smarter than, <laughs> than myself, like maybe I'm talking to one right now who knows the <laughs> Um so, I, so, but that's where I am. I'm finally very comfortable. The hardware, the circuit board needed no revisions. Um, and the packaging works out. Um, I would add a, uh, the only change I, I have in mind so far is a reset, a tiny reset button on the, um, um, for the Arduino Pro Micro, which because it acts as a keyboard and a mouse tends to be a little um, trickier than other devices. And um, if you have trouble, so if I, if people eventually, if I, if I have software out there and people want, it's gonna be open source and people wanna fool with it, um, they shouldn't have to open the case to do something to reset the, um, oh, yeah. the micro during uploading the sketch, you know? Yeah. So I'm trying to make it robust. And so I'm, I'm thinking, you know, a little side mounted micro switch that you could just put a pencil in and 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 reset it if it comes to that. Um, um, but uh, so that's kind of where I am. Um, on the one hand, um, frustrated it didn't just you know it isn't easier. But on the other hand, I'm learning a lot about what really comes out of the keyboard in in terms of uh, um, yeah, especially. Uh, can uh, in combination with the shift key, you know, or yeah. the other, or the other can, uh, keys. Um, 
But um, so I never really thought about it. You know, does the computer, when you hit shift and something else, does the computer always just send a different single character or does it send a combination? And it turns out there's this whole, um, the, the keyboard library, um, the Arduino library, keyboard.h or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the company uh, Plus has um, in it all the, has names for all of the key uh, keys, including all the key uh, control signals that can be sent, whether it's a Mac or a PC, you know, whether it's a command, it's what codes are used for a command or um, uh, or control, all that. And it's very interesting. So it took me off, you know, I'm, I'm not in a rush, but I would like to get it finished. And then it's testing it with all these emulators and make sure yeah. that emulators are happy. The emulators have been op optimized to work with a standard, you know, 101 key keyboard. And I need to figure out um, how to make the Sinclair um, provide the same th things as a 101 keyboard or, you know, um, Time Mouth uh, produced um, I'm trying not to look at his code, anybody's code. So <laughs> it's a learning process. Um, so that's where I am on that project. I'm also, um, uh, I bred brought it uh, uh, an 8255 uh, parallel peripheral, you know, IO chip onto a, well, actually an Arduino, but for purposes of Getting familiar with that chip in its various modes, and particularly how it does handshaking for I/O between, in this case, an Arduino and parallel input and output ports. Um, um, I want to. I'm trying to get really familiar with that and fluent uh, with the idea of interfacing that to the ZX81 in a manner that it's a a fun board to work with. You know. For um, and pretty hard to blow up your yeah. ZX81, you know. Um, so, uh, so I've got that in prototyping, but I'm also trying to make it fun to play with by um, figuring out, you know, when I did it, I made okay. So I've got three I/O ports. What's a nice, easy way to see what's on, let's say, an eight-bit I/O port, output port? Well, a little stack of uh, eight LEDs would be nice. But I'm also trying to think. Well, maybe I'm going to make a bunch of little tiny solderless breadboard components that specifically make playing with the 82.5 a lot of fun, where if you're using that port as an output port, you just plug in this, you know, this um, eight LED with the resistors included and um, on a solderless breadboard and still have enough pins available on a solderless breadboard to use it. So I'm, I'm just kind of tinkering, trying to make an education set, really, cool. and educate myself at the same time. Right, right. Um, <laughs> and, the and, learning, and the other thing is, I'm, um, <laughs> there was a sale this weekend from PAC Publishing. I don't know if anybody buys books from PAC. I used mm -hmm. to buy many more. Not in recent years so much. I seem to get more of my answers from, uh, I don't know, videos different and and a few specific vendors of tutorials and Udemy. I use I like Udemy a lot. Um, but anyway, Pact had a sale for the week. Uh, had free access for like a three four day weekend of their like <laughs> eleven thousand books or something and videos. Oh my. So, got sucked into Arduino Oop because I'm not really, you know, I, I'm not a great programmer. And um, from time to time, I try to learn Python, Oop pro, you know, object-oriented Python programming, or, you know, where I've tried in a few languages, but I'm never really that fluent. I don't uh, need to. But anyway, so I was um, trying to understand better, partly because I see a uh, nice code coming out at Tim Horner in New Zealand. I looked at his code and and it's very nice. So I'd like to be able to turn what I do into proper Arduino libraries with proper mm. header files and C++ files and proper examples that go with it. In other words, the goal is to, to kind of like 
uh, improve my programming style and, and know-how. So it's all like together, but I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the process and <laughs> it may take a while, but some products will flow out. I That's think. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Tim, you got, you got invoked. <laughs> Yeah, I've had zero hobby time in the last four weeks or even more than close to the six weeks. So um, no, nothing to add to the group. Is your job keeping you busy? Yeah, yeah. You want me to talk to your boss? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that'll go over. Well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I won't do anything, but I can talk to you. Well, you know, David, maybe we can guy? all do it together. We can all do it together. You there know. we go. Yeah, you want us to get that from your boss? <laughs> And Stuart, kind of something you kind of triggered in my mind is using the ZX81 or or maybe even the 2068. You know, there used to be the old microprocessor trainers, you know, that the, you know, the various companies put out. Like, you yes. know, the big ones I remember is the Honeywell's, right? And and the Hewlett, or not Hewlett Packard's, or Hewlett Packard had some Heathkit. too, I believe. But Heath. Heathkit, yeah, Heathkit's the big one. You know, maybe something like that that you could plug into the back of the 1000 and you would have all the, like a breadboard, you'd have the LEDs, a buzzer, you know, potentiometers, things like that, that you could interface with the 1000, but it would be more of a, you know, the 1000 would be part of it instead of just kind of off to the side type of thing, you know. But anyway, that's kind of where yeah. I was, that yeah. kind of reminded no, me of that. Um, that's what I'm kind of thinking of. Uh, give people a reason to go up into the attic and pull that. See, who people who play with the idea is to get people who are actively playing with Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and uh, to go up to the attic and pull out that ZX81 and say, "Wow, I never thought of using that thing together mm -hmm. with the stuff that I'm playing with all the time now." Uh, mm -hmm. That's kind of where, where I'm focused. So by doing it myself, trying to figure out what would be uh, you know, uh, I should make it some open source thing so people can order boards or I could, and I would sell them on eBay, something. Like that. So that's kind of where I'm at. At the same time, I'm improving my uh, skill set, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I well, also, it's always, I'm also it's always... amazed when I look um, and I do like, uh, Z I Google on ZX81 and then 8255, I keep finding more projects that people have done since the 80s, some going oh. all the way back to the 80s that people had uh, put, um, uh, I don't, uh, uh, David, you probably know about Maplin Magazine. And yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I didn't really know about it. I may have stumbled upon it once, but they actually have projects there Mm -hmm. for a ZX80 IO board based on the 8255 back in, you know, 1983 or so. And what was what was the name of this magazine? Maple, you said? Maplin. M-A-P-L-I-N. Yeah. It was, it was a, a newsletter or a, or a magazine? It was a real magazine, and I think it was like a electronics distributor. It was for electronics yeah. hobbyists, and they put out a lot of kits, and, and their articles, I mean, they had a very, their issues are online. That's yeah. how I stumbled upon that particular project. So, you know, people have, have married the 80. Uh, yeah, I saw a Centronics interface that somebody put up with a ZX80 to, uh, it, it was in French, but, you know, Google translated it. It was only a few years old. So, yeah. you know, as recently as five years ago, somebody bothered to, you know. so uh, I think I'm in good company as far as that goes. Um, but I want to put the unique spin of it is, is to like make it educational, like um, Adafruit would. Is there any advantage to say using the, you know, the Zilog chips, you know, the PIO or the CTC yeah. instead of, you know, the main mainstream Intel ones? I mean, there's yeah, gotta be I, some advantage. I, I really don't know what the main differences uh, between those two chips uh, would be. I mean, they're very, very similar. So I don't really know. But wasn't the wasn't the eighty two fifty five like second sourced by a bunch of people? Yeah, that was a popcorn part for a long time. So I have OP a feeling them, those will be easier OP to find. And uh, Intel and yeah, well, in the quantities that I will need for the life of this project, <laughs> they're pretty easy to get. Yeah, <laughs> and the PIO is pretty hard to find. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, well I, I, have, I have a question for Stuart or, or maybe uh, someone else who can answer it about. So Stuart, you've mentioned several times that you want people to be able to take these ZX81s out of their attic, but I don't know how many of us have ZX81s in our, in our attic. I don't. Um, how much are they uh, like on eBay now and are they common? Uh, they're not very expensive on eBay. Um, you know, they're, I would say the average price for one untested is under $50, may not have, you know, people have usually lost the cables and um, sometimes the power supply and they say untested, but probably I'm guessing they work. A lot show up with the power supply and a, a 16K RAM pack and the cables. Um, and it's, you're still under a hundred dollars. So they're not hard. They're certainly, you know, 10 times easily, 10 or 20 times easier to find on eBay and buy than a 2068. Okay. I mean, yeah. And when you get it, you're kind of guaranteed that the keyboard won't work though, right? It's almost guaranteed. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> most people plug it in. They see that little K that works and then they're done. They don't bother <laughs> to the buttons. Yeah. Well, so yeah, I've got a couple, but on some of them, if you're lucky, you can just snip the cable and you don't have to replace it. You can just cut the keyboard tail and maybe get it to still fit. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, usually they may work if you don't open it. As soon as you open it and you start flexing that, it's yeah, you you're going to break it. it there, I think. Well. Yeah, um, I think if it's just it's been sealed from since 1982, <laughs> it might still work, right? Well, but if well, any time. Maybe that's my grand plan. I'll get them to go to the attic and then I'll sell them a keyboard replacement. <laughs> <laughs> there you so, go. Adam, do you even have an attic? Uh, an attic? No. No. I've, above me is a roof. That is it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Because, you know, I was going to see if, if Ryan and, you know, Carl can team up to go over to your house and one of them can distract <laughs> you and the other one can sneak it into your attic. Oh, I see. Put one there for me. I see. Yes. <laughs> Hey, Adam. Yeah. There were half a million. Um, I forget if it was the TS-1000. I think it was the TS-1000 sold in the United States. That's a lot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 The skajillion. If yeah. you can find a 1500, you don't need the RAM pack, and it uses the same keyboard stuff. That yeah, Spectre but I don't had. think they sold nearly as many as those. No, no they're hard, much harder to find. That took yeah. me forever to find one. Yeah. Uh, the, remember the... No RAM the, pack model. If I read the instructions correctly, I think the back bit provides 16K RAM pack functionality. Yeah, that's, I think that's right. Yes, yep. that's Which true. is good because there's no pass through. Yeah. Plug it in. Very thoughtful. But uh, I was going to say, Adam. Um, Unless you maybe, buy this from David. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Maybe uh, we can work something out. I wanted to kind of do. Maybe we can do the project together. Some horse trading over here? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've had enough of horses in my life. <laughs> I can trade anything else. <laughs> On the um the 81 keyboard ribbon, I've fixed about four of them now. The um I cut little slivers of um of aluminium tape. I, I reinforced the um um the, the ribbon with the uh, Capton and the little slivers of aluminium tape mm -hmm. and um that just joins joins over the cracks and it also provides a bit of strength and then captain tape and you revive the old keyboards they're, they're actually better they're, they're more responsive than the replacement keyboards they they the you know membrane sort of works better the original keyboard it's just the plastic ribbons um brittle yeah it's a little fragile how do you get electrical connectivity between that ribbon which just has some kind of i don't know i guess they printed the uh yep. The um, there was some printing technology that printed conductive ink on on that flexible plastic. How yeah. do you you can't solder to it, right? You would melt no, it. No, no. I, I use uh, there's aluminium. You can get sticky aluminium tape, and I use a a, a, a hobby knife to cut. You know, well, I, I'd call it a mill thick, a millimeter thick, but a, a thin track, and just lay it over top of the crack. You know, an inch oh. long. And, um, and so what's and there's no adhesive. Because yes, there's adhesive on it. Yeah, yeah. There a is conductive adhesive. adhesive? Is it a conductive adhesive? Yeah, sort of. If you if you hit it with your probes, you can put little dimples in it, and then that touches the uh, the aluminium mm. paint or whatever it is on the ribbon. And um, I, I've fixed quite a few of them that way. It's, yeah, um, um, Tim, uh, Tim, and uh, if you want, you can also get um, uh, copper tape that's designed for that. It does have a 
a conductive uh, adhesive on the back. Yeah, I tried the. Uh, you can get it. That's used for um, for making um, lead light. Um, you know, the the they use the copper tape in um, various hobbyist um, areas. And I tried it, and it wasn't as good as the aluminium tape. I tried carbon paint as well. There's a, a, mm. a, 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 a epoxy um, a carbon paint, but that's too. That's actually itself quite brittle. Um, and my best results was with the uh, with with the aluminium tape. Yeah, exactly what you say. I, tr I tried the copper tape. They use yeah. it for making um, um, stained glass, the copper yeah. tape, and a few other hobbies. Well, um, I've seen other uh, things too with the copper and, and the aluminum. I've just seen the copper for RF interference, right? Yeah, you that's have to usually attach pieces together, right, in a plastic case. That's and the then kind the you need. Yeah, the aluminum ones I've seen also in like monitors. I, I fix monitors here and there, and they use the aluminum ones. Uh, a lot inside monitors to, uh, you know, attach, um, you know, the the metal of where all the boards are in to the plastic, you know, that's that the, the monitors in. But that's actually, a, you know, it's it's aluminum looking. It's not copper, right? So, and so, it is so, adhesive. Yeah. yeah. So Jeff, Jeff, maybe that's my problem. Maybe I was using the wrong copper tape. I wasn't using the the electrically conductive stuff. Yeah, um, the inside, be. the inside of the uh, ZX ZX81 I've got coated in the silver paint because of the FCC. They, yeah, it's it's a version that's designed for this end of the world that was compatible with the the sort of Timex 1000. So it's all silver on the inside. It's mm -hmm. a silver paint on plastic, and there's a little uh, little metal um, grounding strap that touches it. Um, I don't have it sitting here. I think, if I recall correctly, in in some of the 1000s. We, we all, they also had the grounding strap, but there was like this piece of, of black foam with a uh, um, silver tape on it. Silver tape on it. Yeah. Where yep. where was that? Was it on top of the? Uh, I think it was it's on the carbon. RF. It yeah, was on the RF modulator. modulator. Yeah. Okay, yep. that's right. Put the the metal modulator case and wedged it between uh, plastic metalized. Yeah, cases. to make that contact. That's right. David, you you asked that question to the only group of people where like three people can speak up and answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my, the memory was vague, but you yeah, know, I yeah, remember exactly. that thing. Yep, because you kind of when you screwed the board down, you kind of squished that uh, yeah that foam. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, speaking of trivia, um, I oh I I met Ingo's not on this. Uh, no, Ingo's not here tonight. But. Uh, at Thanksgiving, I went up, as I do every Thanksgiving, to uh, near Troy, New York, and Ingo came over. Uh, we had brunch a <laughs> day after Thanksgiving uh, with the family and Ingo as a guest, and um, I handed off some stuff to him, and he, we talked uh, um, Timex Sinclair, and one of the things I gave him was his brother... Um, wants to make clear cases, transparent ZX81 cases. So I happen to have shells, both the metalized ones and the non-metalized ones for, um, with both, I have different, you know, I have the US version with the hole for the modulator um, mm -hmm. jack in one place and I have the European ones in the other place and they're brand new, so they're real smooth. And because uh, he may do them as a mold, uh, just with um, silic, make a silicon mold. But he also has his brother has a milling machine. So um, <laughs> who knows? I will we'll get. <laughs> um, but anyway, he gave him these things. And talking about trivia, um, we're looking at the silver, the metalized case. And I have the I have the shells from the molding company within the in the. Um, plastic uh bags that do you, do you mean the injection done. molding shells those? yeah yeah so oh. the one that, that's silvered you know uh is the one for the u.s so it has a hole for the channel two three selector switch mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. we're looking at this and there's no hole and it turns out that probably because they spray paint them after they make the plastic pieces they leave that little hole um paper thin but they don't open it so that when you spray paint it you don't have your you know metal over overspray hole so he I, I never really looked at it that close except we took out two brand new 
ha shell halves from the bag. And it turns out they, they that must have been a, a process that they did. Timex got them from the molding company. And there's a little paper thin thing, silver, like everything else. And they then must punch that in order to, you know, have an opening for the little channel two, three. So I, I, I was thinking, boy, this would be a tough Jeopardy question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, that would Stuart, be. Go ahead, uh, Stuart. I, uh, I, I don't know if uh, Ingo was still at your house, but uh, he sent me a picture on my phone and a text message of you two hanging out together. Well, and we I, thought in 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 uh, because you guys have your club in Albuquerque yeah. and everything. And <laughs> <laughs> We were right, kind so of I, on a roll. We figured, well, we should take a photo. Yeah, I replied <laughs> with a, a picture of Ryan and I yeah. Um, yeah. holding a Atari 2600 box. So uh, that was my <laughs> <I> reply. Have, yeah. <laughs> I see Keith has joined us after a while. It's too bad Paul has left because Keith actually knows a thing or two about Warievo. Well, it's been a while uh, since I've used that emulator, but uh, the fellow, one of the fellows that wrote it contacted me a long time ago, asked me if I would uh, write some uh, utilities to help it bank switch the Timex ROM in and out of their system. And they wanted me to send him a bunch of software that I had for the Timex. That was as much as I did with that. Well, Keith, I, <clears throat> um... Did a bunch of scanning over the summer, and uh, I don't know which I can't remember which of the magazines it was, but there were there were a couple of your articles about about when you were working on Warrior Evo. You had you know written a review of of the uh, emulator. Maybe it was Cleveland's newsletter that it was in. Uh, you'd written a review of the thing, and then you also talked a little bit in the, in the article about the you know the bank switching stuff that you did. I'll have to find those out, find those and, and post them to the list for folks. <laughs> I was really surprised to get a, uh, even be contacted by that fellow. I don't know. I think he uh, found out something that I was doing with uh, another emulator that uh, I was using, trying to get it to work with the Timex ROM. Uh, I found that this, I can't remember the name of the other emulator now, but uh, I bought the full version that allows you to save and uh, load programs through the parallel port. And uh, that one, I was able to take half of the Timex ROM and insert it into the other emulator and make it work. And uh, the only thing I was missing is like the software uh, didn't have the um, uh, save and load commands for the uh, uh, tape, uh, tape load that save. Uh, so I had to relocate the tape and save commands into the bank uh, buffer or the the print buffer. And so we could have uh, the ability to load the uh, Timex programs into that other emulator. I contacted the author of that emulator and he had no interest in making it uh, Timex compatible. But it was on the internet and this fellow that uh, wrote the emulator we're talking about, he uh, contacted me probably because he saw that. And this was all in the 90s, right? Early 90s. I'm sh sure it was. I've been a long time since I've been <laughs> involved in the Timex, but yeah, it's uh, either the late 80s or early 90s. Yeah, that's crazy. That's cool. Hey, that's cool. David, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Um, I was looking at some of your uh, latest updates on the site since our last meeting. Oh, yeah. One of them um, I, I would like you to talk about, if, in case anyone hasn't seen it yet, is your um, video that you created in your blog entry or your oh, blog post right. on your right. uh, power uh, supply substitution. So a very long time ago, Carl mentioned that he had found these little tiny uh, power switching modules. And when I say tiny, they're like an inch square. And you can, um, and if you've ever seen like the inside of the uh, the 16K ramp pack for the, um, for the 1000 or the inside of um, the spectrum, both of those things have these these little um, little coil. Uh, I don't know what they are. Uh, it's, it's part of a part of a switching power supply. So anyway, these boards that that Carl found 
you have little teeny 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 tiny versions of those uh coils going on um and then i don't know is it a buck converter or something carl yeah mm -hmm. i know the one that i got i don't know which one you got i haven't watched your video yet but it actually did the five volts and the 12 volts yeah on it's the, the same one yeah. yeah okay yeah so you put 15 15 volts you know on one side in one side and you get five and 12 out the other uh and and Frederico has been asking for help on the groups.io list for uh, help in, in replacing the power supply in his in his 2068. And um, I finally said to myself, self, <laughs> uh, do, do this thing. Um, and so I took I had these, you know, got these modules that Carl pointed out and I opened up one of one of the not working so well boards that I have. Uh, and actually what I ended up doing was following instructions that someone else wrote back in the 90s in one of the, the newsletters. Uh, and in his instructions, he was replacing the five volt with, um, he was replacing it with like a high power 7805 a linear voltage regulator. Mm -hmm. um, so I followed his instructions up to a certain point and then dropped in this, this little module, which is astounding uh, and provides, you know, the exact amount of power that, that the 2068 needs. It's one amp of five volts and up to 500 milliamps of 12 volts, which is way more than it needs, but is definitely better spec than the 12 volt regulator in the 2068. Uh, and then as Adam pointed out, I did not record before and after video. And the reason I did not record the video is because the board that I was working on is, I think it has like semi shot RAM chips or something. So it doesn't, it doesn't boot up properly and just generates garbage on the screen. Um, <clears throat> so that's, you know, that's another project to fix. But in the process of doing all this stuff, uh, I was digging through some of the 2068s that I have, and I found one, and I went to plug it in to see what it did, and uh, it turns out that it's from Eric Johnson, who had a relative that worked at Timex uh, Computer Corporation. His relative sent all this stuff to Eric when they shut down, and then it went to Neil uh, Co uh, Cohen, who was a friend of his, and then Neil sent it to me. So anyway, I turn on this, this computer, and instead of it saying, you know, copyright Timex, copyright whatever, it says property of Eric Johnson. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to stop touching this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to mess this one up. <laughs> um, but yeah, Adam, I'll, I'll find, I think I have another board that actually does put out video, and I'll do a before and after. And for Federico, I will get one of those. Oh yeah, Frederico is using one of those those little modern switchers that is the same pinout as the old linear reg regulators. So because that's uh, that's the other big thing that people don't understand with the twenty sixty eight, and I have to watch your video, but you know that that actually has a switching regulator chip in it, it right? and a lot of people doesn't yep. maybe they don't realize that, and that's part of the problem why you get the hiss. Yes, I believe is because yeah. the the switching frequency of the uh, of the switching regulator that's in there. The yeah. other thing is is there's also an op amp that that's it can be used as part of the switching you know circuitry, yep. but they didn't use it in the 2068. So it's just uh, the designers like, hey, we got this free op amp, so we'll use it for the amplifier for the speaker, mm -hmm. right? And so th that's that's more problematic because that amplifier circuitry is actually on the same die that the switching regulator circuitry is on, right? So you're going to get crosstalk yep. <laughs> from that. And uh, so it's not just a simple matter of, you know, oh, let's pull the five volt regulator out and we'll throw a switching one in, which is easy enough to do on the 1000, for instance, right? Or yep. even on the spectrum. Um, on the 2068, yeah, they totally, so it's like, okay, well, what do I need to remove, right? To disable the five volt switching circuitry but keep the op amp running. And luckily there are separate power sources to the op amp individually that you can you can disable the switching circuitry. 
Uh, and then the 12 volt regulator is just a, yeah, it's, a, it's an L12, right? A 78 yep. L12, which is a yep. 100, milli, 100 milliamp uh, TO92 uh, package, yep. right? Yeah. So it's easy enough to just pull that out and and tap in the 12 volts where the output of that would be. But the five volts is a little bit more complicated, right? Do I pull the coil out and just tap it in on the other side of where the coil is? But not only that, you've got the fact that, well, I've got to disable the power to the switching chip, right? Because I don't want any of that noise. Yep. And then I still want to use the op amp because otherwise you're going to have to, um, you know, come up with some kind of little amplifier in there for the speaker. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of just, so it's, this is, a, you know, that's what I mean. This is kind of a bit of a convoluted conversation that people don't understand. There's a <laughs> lot more uh, involved with just switching the power over to a modern replacement. Right. And, uh, so you got, there's a little bit more that you've got to disable <laughs> and work around. Well, and and so um, to your point, when I, I said I did, you know, followed this guy's instructions up to a certain point. And the point at which I stopped was if you clip pin five of that, uh, that TI switching regulator chip uh, and lift it and provide it with, you know, 15 volts or 12 volts, you know, anything above five, but provide it with something, right? That will power the op amp in there. But you know, you the, the other parts you take away disable the the switching uh, regulator portion. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, I think I'll do that as part of the follow up. Both both using uh, power, using the powering the op amp and um, and using a different uh, voltage regulator uh, scheme. Yeah, because it would be good to yeah see the before video and after yep. well, video quality yes uh, before and after and also the audio quality before and after, and after. That yes yeah that way you can see hey do we I'm sure you'll probably get rid of most if not all of that hiss by disabling the switching circuitry period yeah yeah and the and the noise on that video um, quality a lot of that noise comes from the 12 volt regulator right. And one of the interesting things, I don't know if, if you've ever looked into this, Carl, one of the interesting solutions that I saw someone else propose was lifting the five volt power to the SCLD and putting a linear, linear regulator in right there just for the SCLD. Hmm. Um, and I, I'd have to go back and look at it. I think that that might be the problem that Frederico has with his board because Again, with the 2068, you know, if you open it up, there's there's these two wires that run off to different parts of the board from sort of the center, and those are distributing five volts to different parts mm -hmm. of the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if those when somebody takes those off and don't puts them back on, right? You just yeah, like you just created a dead board. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, but that also makes it possible to, you know, to put in a five volt regulator just before the SCLD, and that. That apparently will clear up the video just a little bit too. That's but interesting. Replacing that the 12 volt, I know, does a lot towards clearing the video because I've I've done that. Yeah, and I think the reason is obviously that uh, you know 100 milliamps is just is pushing it right. I Not think enough. it draws a yeah, it's right there, and so that's why you get uh, yeah. That's why a 500 milliamp one. I mean, that's five times more power, and it doesn't take that much because 12 right. volt doesn't go to a lot of things in there. I know it goes to those pots, right? The YUV pots. Yes. And yeah, it goes to the, the right, and it goes to the LM eighteen eighty two or eighty nine or whatever the hell uh, the, video the chip. That's, I mean the um, um the, yes the the video chip the that's inside the yeah the the yeah. the shielding there, and uh, that's really the only two things the twelve volt runs. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but yeah. yeah. So that's that's what I did. I made that that cool video that was fun um and adam um you your question about the soldering iron um now you pay attention to what i actually wrote i do well and you know what <laughs> i used to be a long time ago i used to be you know just like whatever the fuck i could get at radio shack right um but then i was a teenager when i was that way uh <laughs> and a very long time ago a friend of mine introduced me to these uh really nice pencil thin uh, soldering irons from Antec 
and they had these great slip on uh, tips, which were great. I used them for years and years and years. Um, and then I saw a video that somebody did with the one that I'm using, which is this new style of soldering iron that runs off of like a laptop power supply, basically. Yeah, you, you, you just plug this little, you know, it's got a little brick and, you know, it's got a little connector that goes in the end and it's got, I, I, I guess it's got a microcontroller in it because it's got this tiny little OLED yep. screen that tells you, you know, what the voltage is or the heat. You can adjust the heat with, you know, with the buttons and and it heats up like that. I mean, I, I, I set it on, I hit the power button and like within 10 seconds, it's up to temperature. This is this is amazing. Yeah, because I think it uses a ceramic uh, element on it. That's why it heats up okay. like right away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thirteen year old me is blown away by this thing. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a T one hundred or there's there's somebody yeah, like making a, a, a copy. Yeah, TS one hundred or yeah, yeah, because somebody's making a copy of it or a clone. I never got one of those, but uh, yeah, they're kind of cool. I mean, <sighs> you know, like you said, I've got a lot of electronic soldering irons around and. I yeah, I didn't need one of those because I mean I got a bunch of wall ones that my dad had because when he passed away he had a bunch of them. The little they're NICAD powered, but I swapped out them for oh, you know, oh, nickel wait, metal yes. hydride. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Those things are to me the best thing because they're they're totally portable, yep. right? They're battery powered and you can yep. still get the tips for them. Yeah, but yeah, anyway. those were nice. Yeah, I had a friend who had one of those walls back in the eighties. It was it was really cool. Yeah, I think they called them ISO tips, but yeah, they even had yeah. a drill attachment. You could put the drill attachment on so you could drill holes in PC boards. Oh, I did not know that. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. I, uh, I wanted to add something to something you said, David, uh, when you turned on that um, TS-2068 and it had the, someone's name come up. I had something similar happen on an Atari 800XL that had yeah. um, something in there called um, Omnimon, which was yeah. like a... Um, do you know what that is? Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, when I turned on that system and I got it at... Uh, think goodwill or something like that years and years and years ago and if you turn on your um atari systems without like a, a floppy disk boot in it it'll say it'll say boot error and it'll just scroll up the screen mm -hmm. but this one instead of saying boot error it said fuck up and it would just scroll up the screen <laughs> which was <laughs> i was like whoa <laughs> well you know well you know adam we can just burn you some some custom timex Wrongs, oh, I don't yeah. know if I need that one, but uh, when you say the cop, when it says copyright, we can put whatever you want. Well, within the you know the confines of what character limit we have there, we can put whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's about forty characters that you can use. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those are those. Are th thanks, thanks, Tim. That's yeah. That's the iron, the TS one hundred. Yeah, TS one hundred. Oh. Yeah, I think it uses a. You, you can actually, I could think you use a USB C. Because the USB C has power levels, right? I yes. think it could go up to 19 volts at uh, three amps or something like that to get the higher power, right? The higher wattage mm -hmm. levels out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty amazing. Was there was there something else, Adam? That I can't remember if I made other updates. Uh, there you other updates. Let's see. Uh, I think there were just two others. Uh, they're both from the 25th of November. They're little ones, but I don't know if you want to mention them. Uh, one of them was for SRAM high res extended basic manual, which was for the TS-1000. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so... Oh, but this is your site, man. This is your site. Keep up well, with it. Right, right. <laughs> okay, so um, Fred Knackbauer, uh was, was really into the 1000, the ZX81s. And he started, um, well, he had, a, he had a company called Syncware. And then he started a magazine called Syncware News, which was, um, I, I would say it was like sort of like the, um, the popular electronics of, of uh, Timex, you know, magazines, because it was full of, of hardware articles and um, uh, cool, cool kits like that. Um, John Oliger would publish articles in there. There was a series about attaching a TI 9918 video chip to your, your 1000. Um, so anyway, Fred was into that. Fred and um, Wilf Richter uh, did a lot of, of work together and came up with, Wilf came up with this means of 
doing high res graphics on your 1000 uh, that I think was kind of similar to the way that the memo tech uh, high res graphics module worked. And Fred had a little uh, circuit board designed that would put 8K of RAM into that, into that gap between the 8K ROM and where the 16K of, or where, where, the, where the RAM would start. Um, and so that's, that's how Wilf's thing worked. And then they, I think with Greg Harder, so I'm going somewhere with this, they with Greg Harder uh, wrote extensions to the 1000 basic that would let you do high-res graphics programming from basic. And um, Greg is um, retired, but he's active on Sinclair ZX World. Uh, and he posts there quite frequently. Um, he actually has some videos on YouTube demonstrating some of his programs. Um, but yeah, he does, he posts and talks about doing high-res graphics on the 1000. And he posted that manual a little while ago, and I was like, "Oh, yes, we need to attach this to the to the rest of the resources about it." <laughs> but if you if you have you know if you have time, go. I'll, I'll post uh, some stuff to the to the email list. Um, but Greg's got a Greg got a YouTube uh, channel, and um, the the stuff that he's done over you know over on Sinclair ZX World is really cool. He's still doing new stuff. Unfortunately, he does not have a good internet connection. He goes to the library to do his his internet, <laughs> so he can't join us. <laughs> is he in the uh, Is he in the UK? No, no, he's in in um, uh, Colorado, like Denver. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. He's he able, have internet maybe he can travel down for our group. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's only six hours away. Right. <laughs> Um, but I'm just constantly blown away by, you know, when I see one of his posts and, you know, the kind of stuff that he can accomplish The you know, I mean, high-res graphics on the 1000 is, is challenging. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, there's been some good, good stuff coming through. And um, Joe, I got one of these. I got one of these little tape units. Oh. And, um, and I started um I, I copied this program ac assembler it's a, it's an assembler program from cleva c l e v a computerware in brooklyn um <coughs> and i i copied their thing into um audacity and i converted it to mono and i haven't got it to load yet <laughs> I have to figure out what if the file. I think the file has a little bit of a dropout, so I have to like clean it up and normalize it, and then try it again. But you know, loading is real time, so it's slow. <laughs> the it's a is it slower than the TS twenty sixty eight? Oh God, yes. Oh, is it? Yes. Oh, yes. The I didn't know that loading a sixteen k um, RAM program, which I think this is, can take like five minutes. Oh. Wow. Oh yeah. Yeah. So if you have a if you have a dropout at four and a half minutes, you gotta you're screwed. That's how you go bald at fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why in Audacity you normalize. So yes, well, yes. hopefully, well, yeah. Unless a dropout is like a a, a fall off the cliff, then you're not gonna <laughs> have anything there to normalize. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I thought about one of those things too, and it you know the. The main thing is, you know, you're kind of at the mercy of the tape head, right? Yep. You're at the mercy of the mechanism that they're using in that, uh, because as you've, uh, most of you probably haven't really kept up with the cassette world lately, but you know, it's, it's starting to make a little bit of a comeback, but there's only a few companies out there that make new tape transports, cassette mechanism transports, right? And they're all fairly crappy. <laughs> to put it mildly right there you know it's not like the old days where you know you had knock me i mean everybody's making their own right and you had some very very high-end uh you know direct drive uh you know cassette mechanisms that were very very high quality but today you know something new is going to be mediocre at best right so it's almost you know 
if you're going to do stuff like this, it's almost better to get something from the old school that's actually better quality. You know, the mechanism in and of itself, the tape head, the process, you know, the, the analog circuitry that that processes the, the tape noise, um, things like that. But, you know, to say we're working with tapes that are, you know, 30, 40 years old to begin with, it may not really make that much of a difference in the end run, you know, anyway, because because of the bit rod or whatever we're going to call it for tapes, you know, the, the magnetic degradation that happens over that time. But, um, but I'm just kind of mentioning that, you know, that little toy, you know, I call it a toy, but it's not necessarily a toy, but it's just a way to get analog audio into a USB format so you can directly import it into your PC um, in one little cheap unit, which I guess is okay. But, you know, it's easy enough to do that as well with like a, uh you know like a go get yourself a, a mini set nine right or a mini set 10 one of those radio shack ones which is basically the same thing that the 2020 the timex sinclair 2020 tape deck was and i always had really good luck with that tape deck right from timex i don't know if anybody else really used that um uh but i know i got it and it has the tone control on it right which is always I don't know if your little thing there, Dave, that you got. Oh, no, it's just got volume. Yeah, yeah, so the tone control for me was the big thing, right? Because you could really get those highs really peaked up, right? And that's what you you kind of needed. Carl, are you, uh, when you have tone control, because uh, my tape recorder and player has it, you're supposed to turn it up all the way, right? Is it For these kind of things? Well, I mean, you can over... It's it's a It depends on the tape and everything, but, you know... You want to kind of listen to it maybe and turn it up so that it's not distorting the highs. You know what I'm saying? You're not mm -hmm. turning it up so high where it's, it's like, like it's clipping. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. exactly. You got to get it where, um, you know, it sounds decent to you. It's not distorted. You know, it's not muffled. Well, it's um, this horrible screeching noise to begin with. Yes, so, yes, you know. <laughs> right. Well, I'm, I'm pure. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely aware. But it's like you want to get it so it's crisp. You know, it's like you can, ee, you know, it's a, mm -hmm. you know, instead of, ah, or is it, or not necessarily. Make like that a, sound again, Carla. Do it again. Yeah, I, I, I can't, <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? It's not muffled, you know, you need it. If it's muffled, but then maybe, you know, you got to get a good capture out of that, no matter what you do, what the tone control set at, because maybe your azimuth is off. Maybe the tape's degraded so bad that, you know, your, your highs are gone. Yeah. Right. It really needs those. It really needs those low pitch and high pitch transitions right for your ones and zeros to come across really nice so um anyway yeah. i don't know where i was going with that but it was just you know like i said the newer stuff is the tape mechanisms they're using are pretty mediocre these days and i know there's some companies that are actually coming out with new ones that are you know more high quality built because cassette is kind of making a comeback i think task is making a new cassette deck actually and they're using you know they're coming up with their own or having somebody make a new mechanism for it right yep yep brian um, uh earlier before yeah. the show started you showed us your uh you just got one of those too is it the same one as david got no no it's uh it's uh my dad had this he was using oh, for okay. radio oh yeah so i just borrowed it to see what i because i didn't have anything recent at all uh, as far as a cassette deck um and so i just thought well i'll plug this into my usb sound uh adapter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh and then fire up audacity and see what i can get off of it and the first tape i tried it was just working just everything was great uh and then i tried several other tapes and nothing and whilst we've been on here i've happen upon one and i'm having some pretty good success on it so, live while, while we're talking you're recording wow. yeah i was just recording oh. that in playing that into that's multitasking the, the system here <laughs> and you just play record a little bit watch the waveform and audacity um yeah if i had some more skill i might show you just but it's not really that exciting but uh i did get uh the thing is, I need to get the, I thought I had set up the emulator for my joystick, but I don't know that I have. Um, oh, and that reminds me. 
you know, I've, how do you, you know, how okay, do you go set ahead, that up? Because I've got the joystick in uh, Raspberry Pi set up. Let's make sure it's, uh, oh, maybe not. Were oh, you hoping to show us your Raspberry Pi emulating uh, and running your program that you uh, salvaged or archived? I shouldn't say salvaged. <laughs> yeah, I mean, most of these, unfortunately, have been like little working works in progress or just proofs of concept of little things. Um, and this one here, it happens to use the joystick. And so I can't get anything to happen unless I go in here and edit the code to just use keys instead real quick. But um, it did have some, you know, I'll, I'll spin it around. At least you can see the, the listing. Actually, I can flip this to the back camera, can't I? Here you go. <clears throat> oh, look at that. Is that, is that focus on David, uh, can you put the focus on him so that uh, yeah. just his picture is up, is up there? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's That's not cool. focused real well. Oh, anyway. it's, it's fine. I get the, yeah, yeah. yeah, it looks good. So there were some user defined graphics before it, and then I loaded those up and then loaded this thing. So it is wanting the joystick though. So I got to, so there's some animation, looks like a dripping ice cream cone there, I guess. Oh, <laughs> I thought that was a P. <laughs> and then your guy there, which will run around with, so I, I, I'm not sure what, the, what the, the game's called Food Fight. So it was probably, it doesn't look very long. So I suspect it's unfinished. Oh, that's funny. And this is something um, you wrote yourself, you think, or you typed it in? I think so. It didn't, I didn't put any attribution on it. So uh, I probably was trying to come up with something. But just to show you, here's the audacity. Uh, I pulled that in. Those are really low levels. Yeah. And, well, so, and, and what, here's the interesting thing. For a while, I was doing the normalized. But I just pulled this in, so this is what I get. And I don't know. I didn't turn the volume up all the way. I did like what uh, Carl was saying. And you know, back in the day, you never turned it all the way up unless you really knew that was going to work. Um, this is what I get. And then uh, in Fuse, um, you would go in here and say, "Our oh, oops." So I'm going to open up that. Uh, right there, I've moved it. Uh, so there's the WAV file I had for it. <clears throat> and uh, um, right, it just says. It's some number of bytes, um, but then it, I wish it kind of, well, I guess it can't until it scans it, but then you just uh, do the old load on it. Oh, wow. And Fuse seems happy with it. It probably seems to apply some sort of, I would imagine they might have some, it certainly feels like they've got some cleverness in there that is, uh, helping it along, which is good because I was looking at the waveforms and stuff before and I was trying to figure out how I might write a program that would try to smartly follow the waveform knowing what you what it's supposed to be like. And they might have already built that into some of these things. Um, so yeah. Um, having and some was success gonna... there. I was going to mention too that I've got some, I've got two Pioneer Elite cassette dual cassette decks up here, and uh, they actually have a optic out. Oh wow! <laughs> wow. All right, because they're 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 the top of the lines that were back, uh, like I said, in the height of the cassette era, uh, and they will actually put out an optical. Well, it's an RCA connection, so it's a um, uh, a Toslink connector, I guess, but it's an analog version, maybe. I can't remember. Um, 
Yeah. But it's a it's a well not an analog, but it's a oh, digital it's a, out. It's but a, it's a it's coax. The digital, it's the digital coax, yes. Right. It's a digital, but it's not the optical, right? It's the RCA jack. Yeah, it's a digital. But, it, but it's, a digital, it's a digital. Out. I think it's a digital PCM. Right. Exactly. Like, so like I, some DVD players had that. Exactly, and stuff around that time that we're doing. You know, that's how you would transfer digital signals over RCA cables. And I totally had forgot about that. So maybe I'll have to find some tapes or if somebody, or maybe Adam's got some tapes I could try and. No, Ryan has some tapes. Ryan I don't has... have anything. Well, or Ryan, Ryan, Ryan has Ryan's some tapes. Ryan's got a box of them. Um, <laughs> and we live maybe... handy together. So we'll have a copy party, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. I'd have to figure out how to, I need to put that into something and record it digitally. So I have to think about that, but um yeah, I had a had a few in the old box. Oh, there you are. That's the <laughs> that's the box I went through with you. Pretty cool. Now, oh man. Now I think these are unused. So this was a box. It was just full of these blank 90-minute tapes. At some place I worked temp, as a temp in the summer a long time ago. They were getting rid of stuff and <laughs> <laughs> getting rid of this whole box of tapes. And so that's how I got these. So the other ones were my earlier ones mostly cx81 stuff on those primarily but yeah <laughs> quite a few okay hey, well ryan, i was just kind of thinking you... go ahead uh, ryan forget. since you have that box open um and i had never seen one of these in person before could you pull out one of those tapes that's from like the magazine cover tapes from like the uh english magazines because i'd never seen one in person until i went to your house and i was like pretty impressed i was like oh that's cool you know I guess I'm easily impressed. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, talking about the tapes. Yeah. Ooh. Pretty cool. Nice. There's that one. Uh, is this one? I don't know what this is. Yeah, I think these might have been a little later, but uh, I don't know. I don't remember this one. Can't even read it. The something squad. The, the hit MIT. squad. It's, it's a oh, program yeah. called HIT. Oh. Yeah. yeah. For spe one spectrum. Yeah, yeah. So that had to be much later. It says 86 on it, I think. So copyright 86. Yeah, I think that's actually a game uh, that's a sequel called, to a game called School Days. It's uh, mm. an English game, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so, David, we're down to a little less than 10 minutes. Well, uh, do we have any last minute uh, business to? finish up and is there anyone else who has anything else they want to add before we uh close down in about 10 minutes well ada was going to ask something about tapes i was ada oh ow, sorry oh he's hang on let me, let me spotlight you ada this is a brand new unopened tape cassette this is another one are you where are you finding these i have i think about 10 of them anybody wants send me your address I will ship it to you. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. So um, I mentioned I mentioned that I was going to try to finish up my ROM disassembly, and I, I ordered a uh, uh, not for resale, you know, like pretend copy. And it's oh, is that the ones that you sent to Amazon to have them print for you? Yes, and it is. I mean, I'm going to edit it down a little bit, but it it comes in at 500 pages and like an inch and three quarters. <laughs> well, open up the book and show us the inside. Look at that. Words. <laughs> Words. <laughs> Words and disassemblies. <laughs> Dude. Hey, it looks good, man. I really appreciate books that thick. You know, you, yeah. you, you miss those these days because, you know, well, it's like a and the reason I actually the reason I, I I got the I had it printed is because I I'm working on a section where I have to keep referring back to another section, and I was like I'll just get this printed out and have it open and work on it you know and then that solved all kinds of problems, <laughs> um, and then you also get to see the you know where the layout breaks and bad places, um, but yeah my goal is to have that done. <clears throat> I know we did this last time. By the end of this year, <laughs> I said the end of the year, and you gave me you gave me 
well well placed grief <laughs> um so yeah that's that's where i'm at um the only other thing is our let me double check the calendar here but our next meeting is um i believe it's it's the 18th sunday the 18th at 2 p.m so kind of close to christmas but not uh you know there's still time for the secret santa uh white elephant exchange just put <laughs> something in an envelope and mail it to somebody and see what happens <laughs> yeah it's exactly a week before christmas actually so yeah 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 it's actually a week yeah yeah perfect yeah um oh that reminds me uh i know i know some people's addresses and uh, you know what do you what do you guys feel about do you want do you want to be able to find somebody that's near you if somebody exists near you physically i mean is that a that thing that sounds really wanna... odd but uh <laughs> well i mean if you want to just remain anonymous you know like like you know i mean there's the you know there's the albuquerque gang uh, <laughs> the gang, right? <laughs> gang, you know, you want to stay out of alleys around them. Um, my my opinion on that is, I think it's a good idea, but I don't think you want to give out addresses, right? Maybe no, like email, right. right? Just, just, uh, I mean, once you can contact them and you know, because that's kind of how the old user group things used to be, right? You you had a directory of user groups that were close to you, and you could, and a contact person that you could get in hold of. But so I think, yeah, since there's so few of us these days. Or yeah. maybe not so few of us. Uh, it would be nice to kind of see where we are, where we are, all well, at. Well, do you we know, want to just start out with a, you know, low res location list? Right. You know, right. Just, yeah. Maybe just you know, what, uh, what the city or whatever. Emails and general location. Yeah. Okay. Now, I've, I was thinking something more sophisticated, like a heat map, and see Albuquerque would be really, really, really hot. red. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be really green though, if Adam. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Into the yellow. That's a good idea. All right, all right. Well, let's let's think about that. Let's talk on the on the email list about how we can how we can accomplish that. Um, because there's I want to thank I want to thank everyone before this meeting ends too uh, for helping um, uh, answer my questions yesterday uh, and get uh, getting a program running. I, I know Johnny Red's not here, but um, maybe he'll watch this later. So thank you, Johnny Red. And, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. And and you know that reminds me, uh, one of the things on one of those discs is a profile database. And yeah, I, I already loaded that database. one up, David. I already loaded that one up. No. <laughs> <laughs> but now, now that I know the trick, I'm going to go and try to try to extract that and see what's in there. <laughs> the other thing too, we should look at maybe is some uh, Timex Sinclair merch. Yeah, yeah, really. What's with that shirt, Carl? <laughs> hey, man. You know, there's no Timex Sinclair shirts I can go buy. There's no Timex Sinclair shirts. All right. I'd have, all right. I'd have, to, I'd have to make some. I thought I've seen someone somewhere. There's like a CX81 keyboard shirt. Where have yeah, I seen? I think, really? I think there's. I think there's some over in the UK. Okay. I, I have to be honest with you, but I don't think there's. I don't think there's anything here in the U.S. Maybe Stuart. Oh. Maybe Stuart could do something there. I, I don't know, but you know, I mean, I just we bought come up one from somebody else. Shirt. I just bought a black shirt oh, yeah. with a Timex uh zx81 on it i don't i don't I haven't worn it but <laughs> <laughs> yeah it'd be nice to have like a ts2068 you know pcc you know a personal color computer with the colors on it i don't know i'm just kind of throwing that out because um you know something to kind of wear and also we might you know dave you may be able to make a little money off of that uh you know selling those on your site and i'm super merch for that <laughs> yeah i actually <laughs> exactly. uh when I went to a computer show uh, a few years back, I uh, made myself a, because uh, I have a podcast, well, off and on, mostly off for the Astrocade, and I, I made myself a shirt that I wore at the podcast, not at the podcast, at the show that uh, had the picture of my podcast. And uh, so some people actually had heard it. I was like, wow, you, you actually listened to my show? Wow. Well, hello. <laughs> I'm Adam. <laughs> Anyway, just throwing that out there. So it's just getting close to Christmas, you know, and, and presents and things like that. But well, and there's there, you know, is a um, there are a bunch of places that do. Oh, wow. 
uh, Greg, Greg just posted. That's crazy, Greg. Bella Express, you can find some stuff. Yeah. Holy crap. Oh, yeah. That's where I was getting hits is Redbubble. Yeah, right. Redbubble is one place that does uh, sort of. I guess the Simply 80s is in the UK. Okay. Okay. Yeah, look at that. And, not, and I know there's a bunch of t-shirt places, you know, that people make things up and they, they send it to them and they make t-shirts of them, right? And you pick the shirt that you want, you know, the quality and that kind of thing. But anyway, it's just, you know, we can make up our own artwork and, you know, maybe, you know, make up our own t-shirt for this group, this yeah, club. I love um, it. You know, things like Good that. Idea. But <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be cool and fit in perfectly with the nerdy atmosphere. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and then on the back, and, and then on the back, I'm thinking maybe you could have like a, like a rock and roll band tour dates instead of the tour dates. Oh. It'd be all the members. It'd be the members of the team that would be on there. Nice. Although you have to keep updating that because uh, you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings that come in later. <laughs> Very cool. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, let's, let's work on that. Cool. Well, I think that's about it. We're yeah out for time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. It's been fantastic. And we'll see you in two weeks ish. Thanks again for all putting right. us all together, David. Yeah, yeah. Happy to. Happy right. to. See you guys. Good night, all. Have a good Bye. one, guys.